Executive Director of the Michigan Masonic Charitable Foundation, and we're here today recording another session in our Legacy Series, the recordings of past Grand Masters of the Grand Lodge of Michigan. With us here today is Most Worshipful Brother Dean A. Barr, who served as Grand Master in the year 2012-2013. Dean, welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you with us today. <laughs> Let's start at the very beginning. Tell us where you were born. I was born at, in the city of Detroit at the Brandt General Hospital. And when were you born? Uh, September the 9th, 1951. Very good. And tell me a little bit about your parents. Uh, my dad, uh, Paul, was a carpenter. Both my parents uh, migrated to Detroit from the northwest part of Illinois, uh, that, which is a farming area. My dad came here in the early 40s to work in an airplane factory out at Willow Run for the war. And they stayed, they never left. They moved here and liked it. So my mother, uh, Edith, uh, came from the same place. Uh, my father was older than my mother. Uh, he waited till he was almost 30 before he got married. She was still you know, 19 years old or something. Yeah. Uh, large family. Both of them came from fairly large families, uh, farming communities you know, they tend to have large families. And then uh, I'm one of nine kids myself, so pretty good sized family. I guess. But mostly girls. Uh, I have one brother and seven sisters and they're pretty well spread out i only have one sister that still lives in michigan the rest of them are my brother lives in illinois uh, i have two sisters in kentucky uh, two sisters in texas and two sisters in i'm gonna say missouri so let's test you. What are all their names? Okay. Uh, Virginia, Patricia, uh, James, Leila, Linda, Brenda, Paula, and Diana. All right. I think you got them all. <laughs> Very good. So tell us about uh, growing up. Where did you live growing up? I live in Warren. Um, uh, in fact, I lived in the same house until I moved out. Uh, when I got married. Okay. Uh, any special childhood memories? Well, you know, it, it was kind of a rural area. That's, you'd call it suburbs now, but it was kind of out in the sticks. And, and it was a whole different way of life. You know, it, we would go out in the morning and play all day long and come home in the evening. And, you know, mostly played softball or uh, sometimes sandlot football or whatnot, but I think softball was our big sport. So did you get along well with your brothers and sisters? Have a tight relationship? Not yeah. as well as you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you in the pecking order? I'm seven of nine. Okay, so Just you were like one of the kids. Okay. Hmm? You were one of the kids. Oh, yeah. One of the yeah. little ones. All right. My brother's actually ten years older than I am, so we didn't have a whole lot in common. Uh, just when I was starting to get interesting, uh, he joined the Marine Corps and left, so I don't have a whole lot of childhood memories of him. Yeah. Where did you go to school? Well, I went to Schofield uh, Elementary for two years, and then they built a new one that was a little closer to our house uh, called Westview, and I went there until sixth grade, or through the sixth grade. And then in Fitzgerald School District, uh, they had a junior high and a senior high all in the same building. And so I went, seventh grade was junior high school, and I went through Fitzgerald High School and graduated in 1970. Okay, and what happened after high school? Well, actually, I went right into college. Okay. Uh, I went to Lawrence Tech and uh, got a degree, a bachelor's degree in engineering. Uh, Lawrence Tech was local, so I, I lived at home and went to school uh, three years, or no, two years 
uh, full-time days. And then uh, I went, I got married and uh, finished at night. Uh, and three more years, I got my, my degree. Okay. Any military service? Actually, I did. I After I got out of college, there was a, kind of a recession going on. There wasn't much work. And so I joined the Army. Uh, it was in 1975, uh, shortly after I graduated. And uh, Vietnam was just winding down. And I went in and served three years. Uh, I was a surveyor for the field artillery. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just thought I'd be surveying and you know, I would, went along with my engineering background. And it's a lot different surveying for the field artillery. We did a lot of locating targets mostly. Okay. So where were some of the places you were stationed? Well, I did my basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And it was a strange I went through the front gate when I went in, and I never saw the front gate again until 12 weeks later when I come out. And then went right from there to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is the U.S. Army Field Artillery Center. Okay. And it's a, it's a huge place. And I was in a 8-inch self-propelled unit first. Well, I went to Fort Sill and did my basic, my advanced training, AIT, and that was for survey school. And I uh, finished at the top of the class, because most of these guys were lucky if they graduated high school, and I already had a college degree, so I was a little bit ahead of them. But I, I finished at the top of the class, and so I came out of uh, my AIT as a PFC. And it wasn't too long after that I got promoted to uh, a spec four, but the uh, the first unit I was in uh, was eight inch soap well, and that's a big gun. And it, a lot of people think they're tanks, but they're not. Uh, it's just it's just a big gun on tracks that moves around instead of trying to pull it. And I wasn't there more than I don't know three or four months seems like, and they got noticed they're going to Germany. So. The unit was getting ready to mobilize, and I had a contract that said I was going to stay there for a year. I was supposed to stay at Fort Sill for a year. So they uh, transferred me to a different unit. I went to a, uh, what the heck was it, 120 millimeter uh, towed unit. These they were the little cannons that they pull behind a Jeep. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was in that unit until I uh, finished my three years and got out of the service. And we did all of the training on site. Uh, I got to be one of the referees that would go around and oversee the, the training, make sure the other units were doing what they're supposed to do, particularly the survey units. And uh, I had thought about making a career in the military. And then I got a captain that came into our unit that uh, I found out that I wasn't all as important as I thought I was. It was a good life lesson. And the military, everybody can be replaced. And I found that out. And he kind of soured me on the military, so I got out after my first enlistment. And you had said that uh, previously that uh, you got married and your wife Cindy. How did you guys meet? Well, uh, my best friend, uh, his name was Tim Picard, his sister and Cindy were best friends. And we were, I was, just got out of high school. She was, a, she went to Fitzgerald too, but she was a year behind. And it was in the summertime and Tim and I were going someplace and his sister and, and Cindy were on the street and he stopped and asked him if they needed a ride to go someplace and uh, first time I ever met her and he had a van of course back then and somehow she ends up sitting on my lap in the front seat of the van and uh, we okay, got to know yeah. each other <laughs> and then we after that we started going out then 
the rest is history. But uh, yeah. when did you get married? Uh, January twentieth, uh, nineteen seventy three. Very good. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, some children. Just one. Uh, we have daughter Tina, and she's just a great kid. Uh, we never really had any trouble with her. Um, when she was, I don't know, probably 16 or 17, she had a little bit of rebellion, but not, not much. She never really gave us much trouble. Uh, and I think I scared the hell out of her boyfriends when they came over. <laughs> It's funny because I didn't like most of them. Uh, finally, the, the guy she married, though, uh, was the only one I ever really liked. Mm. And it worked out really good. That might have helped her decide. <laughs> you have uh, two grandsons? Oh, I do. Tell us about them. Uh, Zachary and Garrett, they're twins. They're eight now. They're, they'll be nine in January. And they uh, are just more active than you can believe. I get tired just watching them sometimes. But uh, their current love is soccer. They're, they're soccer stars. I went to their game a week and a half ago. And their team won is six to nothing, I think. And uh, they don't keep score, but the kids know what the score is, trust me. And uh, they're, they're funny. They, they're not as fast as they think they are. Some of the other kids that are littler, because they're, they're big boys for their age. Uh, some of the other kids just seem to be a lot faster, but they they can kick the heck out of the ball. That's good. Tell us about uh, your working life. What was your very first job? Oh, man. I think I worked in a, uh, I worked in a laundromat when I was about 16, uh, mopping floors and uh, cleaning lint traps and that kind of stuff. And then I got a job working in a gas station, you know, pumping gas. Back then, yeah, the gas station actually mm -hmm. pumped gas. And I worked in the garage some, uh, but my job was to pump gas. But, you know, I changed the starter or battery. My father was a, uh, he called it a shade tree mechanic. And uh, he did more cursing than work. I think <laughs> he, he thought that made it go together better. But, uh, we're always tinkering on something. And I remember my buddy Tim had this old van and the thing died on him. And, and we took the engine out of that van and completely took it apart and rebuilt it. And I was just astounded. We put it all back together and the darn thing worked. I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine doing that today. Of course, there's a lot more stuff on it today. But yeah, we did a lot of tinkering with cars and motors, uh, try to fix them, fix the bodies up with Bondo, and I could do a little a little brazing and welding. And I learned that from my uh, uncle brother-in-law. So where did you uh, progress from there after the mechanic oh, stint? After working in the, in the garage, um, Um, my first actual job, because most of the time I worked with my dad. He was a construction guy, a uh, carpenter who did everything, uh, did a lot of concrete work, cement driveways and that kind of stuff. We'd build garages. And so from the time I was big enough to carry lumber, I was carrying lumber or, or wheeling cement or digging ditches or something. Uh, and that's where I got my beginnings in working in construction. But when I was in college, uh, after Sydney and I got married, I took a job for a con company called Hillier Construction. Uh, I had, at that point, a little over two years of college, and he needed an estimator. And I'd taken some estimating, and, and I could read blueprints and do takeoff. So he hired me as a junior estimator and doing takeoffs and try to price up what things cost. And I learned a lot from him and I was with him for you know, three or four years. And then I went to another company, uh, 
uh, worked for one of the big companies, uh, Deere and Armstrong, which was one of the large general contractors at that time, and I worked as a surveyor. Uh, and I worked with them only for about a year, and that's when, when I left there, they laid me off, and it was like in just before Christmas. They were pretty cold-hearted. <laughs> but, you know, the, the job was done. They didn't have any work. And uh, from there, I went in the, in the military. And then when I came back, I went back to work for um, Hillier and worked for him for another several years. And I worked for a number of different contractors, uh, going from junior estimator to a senior estimator. And, and then I became a project manager and a project director. And uh, Went worked for a company that did concrete floors as their estimator and then project director. And the one old Italian guy that run the thing, and he was, he had to be in his 70s and he could still outwork three guys. And he didn't like me just sitting in the office. And so he'd get me out in the field if we didn't have work to be estimated and uh, put me out there finishing cement or hauling concrete or doing something. You learn a lot more being out there than you do ever looking at the drawings. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that was a good life lesson too, you know, mm -hmm. learning the pieces and parts, and actually getting your hands dirty. So how did you get into the position you're in now with the state of Michigan? Well, I worked for a number of other companies. Uh, I worked for George Auk, which is a big company. They're still a big contractor today. And uh, then I went to work for Garrison Construction as a uh, a project uh, project director. I had five or six project managers working for me. We did a lot of GM type stuff. And uh, the guy that was run their operations was a little dictator. And uh, he and I bumped heads, and I just I got tired of it. And there was an opening with the state. I went and applied for it, and they thought I was overqualified. But they said, well. Give you a shot, and uh, I just loved it. Uh, it was nice being on the other side because all those years working construction projects, and you got people coming down on you, particularly inspectors and owners and whatnot. And now I'm the owner and inspector, and I like to give the contractors a hard time. It's so, reverse roles. Plus, I know when they're feeding me a line and. So what exactly is your position? What's your... Okay, uh, I work for the Department of... Well, it used to be Management of Budget. Now it's Technology Management of Budget. They merged this. And I work in the Office of Design and Construction. And I'm part of the Quality Assurance Division. I'm a field representative. I'm the owner's rep for state construction projects on project sites. And I go out and oversee the work, make sure they're following the plans and specs, uh, review pay requests, review change orders, uh, run project meetings or attend project meetings, and uh, just generally oversee the construction of the work. How long have you been with the state? Uh, 14 years. Very good. Do you... Uh have any hobbies? Any? I know you like to golf. Any sports you like to participate in or watch? Well, I like all of the sports. I'm a big baseball fan, a big Tiger fan, and I think they have a great team this year. And probably the best starting rotation in Major League. You need a closer, but great team this year. A lot of people don't like Jim Leland, but I think he's a terrific manager. I'm also a, a big football fan, but I the Lions have been so disappointing for so long. It's, so I'm generally more of a college football fan. <laughs> it's just hard to get too in truths about the Lions. And, and what college do you root for? Actually, yeah, I'm a U of M guy. Okay. And the reason for that is because uh, my best buddy, Tim, his older brother went to U of M. And when I was going to Lawrence Tech, Friday nights, we'd go out to U of M. And he'd get us tickets, student tickets to the football games and stuff. And we'd stay in the dorm overnight and spend the weekends out there. I uh, had a lot of fun out of U of M. So that, 
I always cheer for them. I'm not anti-Michigan State, but if the two are playing each other, I'm going to cheer for Michigan. All right. Any hobbies? Uh, I do like to read, and I particularly like to read uh, Revolutionary War stuff. I've read a lot of uh, biographies on our founding fathers and the revolution. I find it as a fascinating time. And most of those guys were, were Masons, but they don't really say a whole lot about that in the biographies that they write about most of our founding fathers. It's hard to find that Masonic connection. When I was a kid, I, I was a, a coin collector and stamp collector. And I, I think I still have those someplace. I really was never that avid of a stamp collector, but I, I was a coin collector. And when I was probably 10 or 12, I started collecting pennies and went up to nickels and quarters and silver dollars. But yeah, I, still, I plan on leaving them to my grandson someday. Well, good. When did you uh, first learn about the Masonic fraternity? Well, uh, one of the companies that I worked for, I missed... Uh, was uh, M. Weingarten Associates. They did commercial work, a lot of work for Kmarts and Kroger's and that kind of stuff. Built a number of Kmart stores in the area. Uh, the vice president of operations there was a guy named Bill Smithers. And he was an old World War II vet. And I just had the utmost respect for him. The guy was a straight shooter. If he told you something, you know, you could go to the bank with it. And he was Mason, which I didn't know, but uh, he was up, and then he started telling me all stories about his lodge. Every time we, we'd go to lunch all the time, and he'd talk about the things that they're doing. They, they did trips and uh, parties and whatnot. And he was baiting me, and he, he told me later, it, I was kind of slow because it took me six months to ask him the question, but he was trying to get me interested, and, and he did. And uh, one of the superintendents that worked there was also a past master, that both from uh, Lola Valley. And when I was learning my ritual back then, you had a long proficiency you had to learn. Uh, I would, his office was right across the hall from mine. I was the chief estimator. He was a field operations vice president. I actually got to be a vice president estimating before I left there. But I would walk across the hall, Bill, what's his word? Because <laughs> it was all one letter key back then. And he always knew, right? You know, he'd do all the, all the degrees, all the lectures, everything. He knew it all. And so did uh, uh, Ray. Uh, what was Ray's last name? Uh, Ray was a past master for Lola Valley, and, and he was a good ritualist too. And a lot of times, I would s schedule my field inspections near the end of the day, and he would be my last stop. And then we'd stop for coffee, and we'd sit there for sometimes an hour or two just going over ritual. And that's how I that's how I learned my three degrees, and learned lectures and stuff too. They helped me with that. So you joined Lola Valley Lodge. What year was that? Uh, that was. 1986. And did you get involved right away? Uh, actually, I did. I was raised on June the 24th, and as soon as we, as soon as I was raised, they went dark. So I had two months over the summer, and Bill Smithers said, "You will learn your your Master Mason proficiency." And so over the summer, I did that, and then in uh, our business meeting in September, I gave my proficiency, and started setting in different chairs, you know, they let you sit wherever you want. And when you could do the old proficiency, you could pretty much open and close lodge at any station. So I always be a steward, but if the junior ward chair was open, I'd jump up and volunteer. But I went to lodge regular right right away. Of course Bill would have probably kicked me in the butt if I didn't. And uh, that that November, I got elected as a senior steward. And we had two elected stewards, and uh, both spots were open, and I, I got more votes than the other guy, so I got the senior steward spot. And I moved on up and was master there in uh, 
1991. That was uh, the year, year, year that was great. So, any, so, any uh, uh, vivid recollections? Vivid recollections of the year? I was the youngest guy in the line for a long time. And I wasn't that young. I was in my 30s. But we had a, a, it was an older group there. And as I went up the chairs, we started getting younger guys uh, involved. And when I was master, we had quite a few young guys that started coming out regular. And we had, I hate to say it, but it was our own little clique. And it really helped bring the, the lives together. And one of the guys that I helped raise, uh, his name was Dennis Brown. He wanted, he wanted to be a Shriner. That's why he joined. He had a, he had a son who uh, was born uh, with pediatric problems. He couldn't walk. And, and the Shriners had a number of surgeries on him. And so he wanted to join the Shrine to uh, give something back. And that was the only reason he joined the lodge. Well, I got him involved, and we got him hooked in, in Lodge. And so he was an avid uh, Blue Lodge guy. He was my chaplain when I was uh, master. And we had just uh, so much fun. His his house was only about a mile from the Lodge. And he had a huge backyard. He had a swimming pool because his son, Mark, uh, could do therapy in the pool so they, they could justify it. And we had a lot of parties over at his house. The whole Lodge officer corps would go over there, and we'd have parties at Dennis's house. Because I lived on the other side of town. I joined over there because of Bill and Ray. And it wasn't that far from where I worked, so I generally take change of clothes and change at work and go to lodge. Uh, tell us about some of the uh, pendant bodies that you belong to. I know you're active in Scottish Rite. And... Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I joined Scottish Rite. I wasn't going to join anything. I wanted to. I got in line at, at Blue Lodge right away, and so I wanted to do that. Well, we had an old past master at uh, Lola Valley. His name was Nate Banks. Nate was a great guy, great ritualist, and he was a very active Scottish Rite guy. And I think it was 1988. So I'd been a Mason for a couple years. Nate comes up to me with an application and says, "Here, sign this. You're joining Scottish Rite." He was commander in chief. I don't know if he was going in as commander in chief. He says, you're going to come in while I'm commander in chief. There wasn't any debate about it. Nate just said you were going to do it. So, okay. Sign, fill out the application and join Scottish Rite. And back then, Valley Detroit had uh, close to 20,000 members. I mean, it was huge. And I, I hear stories about guys that wanted to get on stage and they just couldn't do it. Well, Nate knew that I was a pretty good ritualist in Blue Lodge, and he put me on stage the first reunion after I was, uh, actually the reunion that I went in, Doc Hagee was most wise. Doc later went through the consistory line, but he was uh, in the Rose Croy. And I was in the Rose Croy degree, the, the 17th degree. I was one of the acolytes. I carried a, a torch, and it, they had actual <laughs> torches back then. <laughs> I don't know how they got away with it. But I was one of the acolytes in, in 17th degree when I went in. So I was on stage right off the bat. And then Nate put me on stage the next reunion. And I haven't missed one since, I don't think. Yeah, you got hooked. So what was your favorite ritualistic part in the Scottish Rite? Ah, that's easy. Commander-in-Chief in the 32nd degree. That's, without a doubt, it's been my favorite part. And my next part was... Uh, Zerubbabel in the 15th degree. It's an excellent part as well. Yeah. <laughs> you um, currently belong to Olive Branch Lodge. I do. Which is a very active and large lodge. Uh, how did your affiliation there begin? Well, I was real active in lodge, and we have an association uh, called the Masonic Masters Association here. And so after I was master of the lodge, 
uh, somehow I got elected to a spot in the Masonic Masters Association. And you go to all of these, they call them senior warden dinners, and we had a lot of them back then, and not so much anymore. They probably only do maybe a dozen. We did like 40. I mean, it was every week there was a couple going on. And this guy named Frank Fuller was from Olive Branch. And he was a master the same year I was. And we always seemed to end up in line next to each other whenever anything was going on. And Frank was uh, just a funny old hillbilly. He was a great guy. And he was always volunteering me to do something. Because back then, at the warden's dinner, generally you would do degree work. And he would volunteer me for part, and so I would volunteer him for part. And we uh, just started getting to be really good friends. And he invited me over to uh, Olive Branch. And Olive Branch had a bunch of young guys over there that just did a lot of stuff. And you know, Lowell Valley was still a bunch of you know, old World War II vet type guys. And we went to a lot of their parties. And about the same time, I had a little problem with the worthy matron of the Eastern Star at uh, Lola Valley. And, you know, I tried to uh, make it up, tried to apologize, and uh, she wouldn't have anything to do with it. So I, okay. And I was in the Eastern Star at the time, and we withdrew. And all of the temple board and everything were past patrons. The Eastern Star ran the lodge, which I found out later. I mean, if you didn't have the Eastern Star on your side, you weren't getting anything done over there. So I said, to heck with it. I either going to drop out or I'm going to go someplace else. And Frank said, well, you got to come over here. So I did and never regretted it. I've always uh, had a great time over there, and it seemed like at that there was a transition. I was the young guy over here, went to there, and I was one of the group, and there were a lot of younger guys than me, and now I'm, I'm the old guy. And, uh, I'm, I understand how that works. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the Commander-in-Chief being your favorite uh, spot. Um, what leadership positions have you held in the appendant bodies, in addition to being Commander-in-Chief? You know, um, Masonic Masters, I was the president of that. Okay. And I was also, uh, I think I was the treasurer for a year or two. Pendant bodies. You recently joined the York, right? Uh, well, it's actually... Like a couple of years. Four years now. Okay. Um, I don't have any offices there. One of the things that we did at Scottish Rite, and it was part of our, it was part of the membership committee, we started a Toastmaster club. And the idea was the Toastmasters would help the Scottish Rite members and officers be better speakers. Mm -hmm. And it started out 100% Scottish Rite people, but it was an open club. And a lot of guys, they didn't care for it. And by the time we folded up, six years later, uh, it was more than half was non-Masons. But I was president of that. I went, held every office in uh, Toastmasters that you can do there. And we went to uh, district and regional competitions for public speaking and stuff. Uh, I won a couple of small awards, nothing huge, but it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Well, speaking of awards, um I know that you've received several honors and awards in your Masonic career. What are some of the most memorable or the ones that meant the most to you? Well, you know, the, the 33rd degree has certainly got to be up there. But I think the thing that touched me the most was the year that I was the class honoree for uh, the Valley of Detroit. That's, you know, that was just tremendous because, you know, that's, it's not politics or nothing. It's just the guys pick somebody that they think is worthy. You know? It's your peers acknowledging yeah. your contribution. Exactly. I understand. Um, tell us about some of the Grand Masters that you knew before your time in Grand Lodge. Okay. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, back when I was an officer in Blue Lodge, back in the 80s, 
We didn't see too many Grand Lodge officers. Uh, but we had Leonard Noshul lived not far from uh, Lola Valley, and he would stop in once in a while. And so I got to know Leonard and uh, actually got to know him quite well and, and really liked Leonard. He was kind of a bullheaded German, but he was a, was a good guy. And uh, his wife, Ruth, uh, they lived in Redford, and that's where Lola Valley was in Redford. And then, of course, Bob Osborne. Uh, Bob was, you know, just bigger than life back then, you know, Blue Book Bob. He knew everything and everybody. And for a long time, I didn't think Bob liked me. Bob was hard to get to know. But Bob was also hard to hear. And if you were on the wrong side of him, he couldn't hear you. And I figured that out finally. And so I would try to always stay on the side where he could hear me. And... He was a great storyteller. Uh, he was a great dinner companion. I always had a good time with Bob. But a lot of people didn't care for Bob because he was, uh, you know, by the book all the time. And he knew he knew he was in charge most of the time too. I, I actually think he was a little on the shy side too. I think he forced himself to to be outgoing. But one on one, he was great. Oh, and, you know, like for nice. dinner companion, he was a he was a terrific storyteller. And he did so much and traveled so much. He had a lot of great stories. I agree. So, tell me about your uh, kind of your first introduction into Grand Lodge. I know you were a regional Grand Lecturer. Were you a DDI before that? Um, how did you get into that position? Um, Paul Cross actually got me involved in my first Grand Lodge committee, and it was in. I think, 94, 93, 94. He was the chairman of the Grand Lodge Parade Committee. Back in those days, we had a parade in Elma every year. It was the first weekend in August. And they had a, the Eastern Star had a fair. and It was a big event, and the people at the home just loved it. And Lola Valley always went up there and worked as marshals or marched in the parade or did something. And so I had been going up there for a number of years, and that's, I met Paul through the senior warden dinners, and the first time I ever met him, uh, we talked, and I don't know, we just hit it off, and it was, it was in January, it was cold, and he and I were the last two guys standing in the parking lot at, I don't know, midnight or whatever it was, and freezing, and just standing out there talking, because they'd thrown us out of the building already, and Paul asked me to uh, help him with the parade committee. And then uh, he wanted me to take it over. He, he had done enough. And so the first year I was, we were co-chairman, and then uh, he stepped down and I was the parade chairman for two years after that. And that was a job that just, there was a lot of pressure and you know, I didn't know anything. But, uh, so I was chairman of the parade committee for a couple of years and Paul got me into that. And uh, that was my first taste, and I got to know Bob Stevens, and of course, Bob Osborne even more so back then. And then Paul got into Grand Lodge right at that point. And after he'd been in Grand Lodge for a couple of years, he come up to me and says he wanted me to be his chairman for his arrangements committee. I don't know where this is coming from, you know. But I said, okay. I didn't have a clue what I was getting myself into. And we planned, of course, Paul started, you know, four years ahead of time. And back then we did a lot more than they do today. We went out and interviewed hotels and everything, tried to figure out where we were going to go. And we did all that. So I got to know Paul real well through all of that. And Paul must have seen something in me that uh, he thought I was capable of doing it because I never thought I could. Um, and then after, we had a terrific Grand Lodge session, and Rick Ruland came to me after that. He thought I did a pretty good job. He asked me to chair his Grand Lodge Arrangements Committee. So I did that, and uh, it was a lot better because I knew what I was doing this time. And, and uh, a lot of different personalities, too, between Rick and Paul. I don't know which one's better, but they're different. I had a great time doing it. And when you do that kind of committee, 
you really get to know a lot more about Grand Lodge than just your regular Blue Lodge past master. And I, I found out a lot about what goes on at Grand Lodge. Then, of course, there was a guy named Walt Wheeler who came to me after that and asked me to chair the uh, Lodge of the Year Committee. And uh, I did that for a couple of years. And I'm not sure why he asked me to do that either. But, uh, you know, get you more involved. And so I had a pretty good idea of Grand Lodge. I knew a lot of the, the people at that point. And then Iris Slavin had a, kind of a, a rough start to his year. Removed an officer. And he came to me and asked me if I would take his place. I said, no, absolutely not. And so about two days later, he'd come back and says, will you reconsider? <laughs> and so I went and asked Cindy, and she said, no. And about a week later, he came back and said, I really need you to, to take this spot. I'm not sure why he was so insistent. Maybe he couldn't find anybody, I don't know. And so I kind of sweet-talked Cindy a little more, and she finally relented. And I agreed to uh, accept the appointment, and that got me in a journey through Grant Lodge. And you, you'd had some other experiences as well. I know, like I said, you were a regional grand lecturer. You were Michigan Mason of the Year. You, well, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, a guy named David Fluke appointed me as a regional grand lecturer. Um, actually, before that, uh, Eddie Stephanie uh, had the uh, uh, ritual proficiency examination mm -hmm. stuff, and me and Don Buxton, my best friend, stood in front of Eddie and went through all three degrees and got our master ritualist proficiency in 1997. And because of that, I think David uh, appointed me as a regional grand lecturer because I was a master ritualist. And I did that for, I did that for, uh, I think, two and a half years. And part of the problem, I really enjoyed being a regional grand lecturer. And Eddie thought I was doing a great job. I mean, he was disappointed that I stepped down, but I was in consistory line at the time. And I just, I could see the conflict coming. And I said, you know, I can only do one of these. I gotta let one of them go. And I really wanna be commander in chief. So I, I resigned from the regional grand lecture. <clears throat> For the benefit of our viewers, why don't you tell them what it takes to be a max, master ritualist? Because most of them probably don't know. Well, the, the way it worked, we had to do the opening, uh, the degree, including obligation, with all the wraps and signs, you had to be able to do all the lectures, the charges, and the closing, and you were allowed 15 mistakes. And that was for, you had 15 mistakes in each of the three degrees. It's quite an accomplishment. And most guys, today, they do one at a time. But Don and I, had, we had been doing those lectures for a long time, and that's really the, the big stumbling block, because most people, if they've been an officer, can open a closed lodge, and most of them can do the degree. But a lot of guys today don't do the lectures. Who were some of your Masonic mentors? Well, certainly uh, Bill Smithers. Uh, until the day he died, he was somebody that I looked up to. And, and it, you know, it's, I don't remember what part of the ritual or lecture it comes, but, you know, we know masonry through individual masons. And Bill lived masonry his whole life. He was a man that I, I really looked up to. And my father was, uh, of course, I love my father, but he was not a real good role model. He was a uh, hard working, hard drinking. Uh, he had certainly had some problems, but 
Masonry would have been good for him, but he he never was. And it might have helped him be a little more grounded. But he was a pretty wild guy his whole life. Uh, I never witnessed it, but you know, he said, you know, he talked about fights and stuff that he'd get into. And, you know. Bill Smithers was a guy that I I really was uh, looked up to and was very proud of. And, and I was surprised that he had taken such an interest in me, you know. Uh, Nate Banks was another mentor, but he was a mentor in Scottish Rite more so than in Blue Lodge. And uh, Paul, Paul Cross was certainly a mentor. I would have never gotten anywhere, well, I can't say never, but it, certainly he helped me on my journey. And I, I look at guys like Bob Conley, you know. Uh, I've known Bob since the early 90s when they were doing the renewal programs back then with Dudley and you know, some of that. And Bob always impressed me. I, I think he was a grand lecturer for a year before he got into Grand Lodge. But I always loved his sense of humor, just the way he could uh, talk to a crowd. and. He always seemed to have the right answer or good answers. And even even when I was Grandmaster, I, I looked to Bob for, you know, I would talk to him about things before I would make a decision. Of course, you use jurisprudence for that a lot too. But. Um, obviously, um, you're committed to the fraternity. You've been involved with the fraternity almost since the day you joined. What uh, what keeps you motivated? What makes you passionate about Freemasonry? It's the friendships, the, the brotherhood. You know, last year, you know, you're on the go so much. And I would come home from work and I would just be tired and I want to take my shoes off and just sit and relax. And I would force myself to go to lunch. And those guys, I would just be energized. You know, I would feel so much better. And by the time I went home, I was, I was re-energized, reinvigorated, and I don't know anything else that could do that. And every week that would happen, you know. You uh, mentioned how you got started in the Grand Lodge line through an appointment uh, by Most Worshipful Brother Ira. Once you got in line and started that progression, and even continuing on to when you became Grand Master, what things surprised you? What things did you sit back and say, whoa, I didn't expect that? I, I was really lucky. I had some just some really terrific brothers that were in line at the same time, both in front of me and behind me. And I've made friendships there that you know, will last the rest of my life. And I, I wasn't, I thought I knew Grand Lodge. You know, I, I wasn't like some guys that come in and they, you know, didn't have a clue what they were getting involved with. And until I became Grand Master, I think, you know, nothing was too surprising. It was kind of expected. But when you become Grand Master, it's, there's no way of explaining it, I don't think. Uh, everything's on your shoulders, it seems like, or you feel that way. And then, like we talked earlier, it seemed like so many of these guys that are brother Masons that should be responsible individuals just they're like little kids, you know, they don't play well in the sandbox, I don't know. And they they want they want Grand Lodge to solve their problem, but they want it to solve them in their favor. They, and I, I, too many times I would say, well, I'll come and solve your problem, but you probably won't like what I'm gonna do. And they, uh, generally they'll try and fix it themselves when I tell them that. But it's just amazing how they always look to somebody else to try and solve their problems, like little kids. I didn't expect that. So when you uh, became Grand Master, I'm sure you had several highlights as well. Tell us about a few of them. I had a number of really wonderful things happen. And I feel like I had a great year without a whole lot of controversy. Uh, the year before, Grandmaster Kaiser had had some serious problems with the shrine. 
Well, the leadership in the shrine made some grave mistakes, but they changed leadership right at the beginning of my term. And the new imperial potentate wanted to meet and see if they could resolve our problems. And he came to Michigan, and we sat down like men and masons and went over the problems. And at their imperial session, they had overruled some of the things that their potentate the year before had done and really vindicated Grand Master Kaiser completely. And he and I made, uh, made agreements. He agreed to do basically everything that I asked. And I felt really bad for the Shriners that weren't involved. There were so many guys that were hurt by that that didn't have anything to do with it. And so I wanted to fix the problem. But I didn't just jump right in. I waited till we had a good opportunity. Uh, and I wanted to look him eyeball to eyeball and him tell me face to face that he would not do that again. And, you know, Michigan was the Supreme Authority in Michigan, and Grand Lodge was Supreme Authority. And we came to agreement, and on my way home from that meeting, I called all of the potentates and told them that uh, we were reestablishing fraternal relations and that they could go ahead and plan their events, because they weren't supposed to have reunions or anything, or ceremonials. Mm -hmm. And that was a big big event, and surprisingly, the uh, the Shriners all loved me. Well, that's good. That, that was certainly a highlight. Any yeah. others? Well, we did a... Uh, I, I, I will admit, I'm a Scottish Rite guy. I do belong to all the other bodies, but that's, that's where my first love was. And I had mentioned to the Commander-in-Chief of Valley of Detroit, who was also my senior grand deacon, that I would like to see an all valley reunion. We had tried to do it a couple years ago, and just couldn't seem to get it to happen. And so Dick Wisely took the ball and ran with it and made it happen. We had a uh, an all valley reunion up in Marquette in April in a snowstorm, and it was great. The guys loved it, and. I rode the bus up with the with the hooligans from the Valley of Detroit, and I say that as an endearing term because they're 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 a little wild, but they're great guys, and we had just a blast on that bus. The last half an hour, forty five minutes, was a white knuckle drive because we ran into a snowstorm just before we got to Marquette. But we had a great time up there, and I think the Valley of Marquette was just energized by everybody being there too. I think it's probably helped their valley for a long time. It was a great weekend, and everybody that I talked to that was there enjoyed it tremendously, and the Sovereign Grand Commander was able to join us as well. Yes, I, I got a chance to get to know him a little bit. He's got, he's got a wonderful sense of humor. He does. And uh, it was nice to be able to sit down and talk with him, and he really seemed to enjoy himself. So what do you think the fraternity needs to do to grow and prosper? Where do we need to go? We don't do a real bad job of bringing guys in. We do a really bad job of getting them engaged and keeping them. That's, I think that's where we really fall down. And like the trip to Marquette, every one of the guys on that bus are engaged. They drank the Kool-Aid. They're, they, they get it. They, they now, they love the fraternity. And I don't, would not expect to see them drop out. But how do you get them to get engaged uh, on a global basis? You know, not you, you can't do that kind of thing with every lodge. I'm, I'm seeing a lot more younger guys that are professional guys come in. We have a couple guys in my lodge that have master's degree and another one that's uh, getting ready to work on his master's degree. Uh, we didn't have that 20 years ago. It was kind of a blue-collar system, but I, I think I have great 
hopes for our fraternity. I think we're moving in the right direction. But we have to do something to get them engaged and keep keep them involved with the with the lodge. And there's nothing wrong with them just being Blue Lodge Masons. I think sometimes we do too much and it tends to make our wives unhappy. Yeah, we don't want that. No. <clears throat> what would you tell a young man that came to you and said he was thinking about becoming a Mason? What advice would you give him? Well, first I would tell him I think it's a great idea. But I would ask him uh, you know, what his reasoning was, uh, why he wanted to do that. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the commitment, the involvement, the finances. Uh, why does he want to do it? You don't want somebody join them for the wrong reasons. Uh, if they think they're going to go and find uh, lost treasures or something it's of the Templars, it's not going to happen. And, and some of these guys, they, they see these movies and they go on the internet. And there's a lot of bad information out there. Mm -hmm. And so I would try to get them in the right frame, you know, let them know what, what he really would be getting into. Okay. What would you tell uh, somebody that came to you and he was going in as worshipful master for the first time? What advice would you give him to have a successful year? Well, first of all, I would tell him that he needs to do a lot of planning the year before. When you go in as master, when you get installed, you should have the year planned out. I don't know that that happens in a lot of cases, but I would tell them that you're going to have these old past masters on the sideline telling you, in my year, we didn't do it like that. And you know, you can, you can get advice from those guys, but the biggest thing I would tell them is get your blue book out and read it for yourself and you figure out what it says. Those old past masters have funny memories, and the Blue Book has changed a lot from when some of them were in the East, and you can't rely on what they're telling you. You have to make the decision, because it's going to be your responsibility, you have to live with it. That's what I would tell them. Okay. <clears throat> what advice would you give somebody that came to you and said, I'm really seriously thinking about running for Grand Lodge? <laughs> You know, my, my first thought is I tell them to run, but I, that's not true because I, I really enjoyed Grand Lodge. I loved being a Grand Lodge officer. And from the time I was a marshal all the way up, you know, I've met so many great people, traveled all over the state, and you know, I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't in the Grand Lodge line. And I've met lodges that I didn't know existed. You know, we got 300 lodges in the state. And, and I thought I did a lot of traveling before that, but you know, I've probably only been to 30 or 40 lodges. You know, I've been to a couple hundred now. Uh, and it's, it's really wonderful to see some of these little towns that you know, looks like a, just a little crossroads there, and they have a beautiful little Masonic temple. And that, that's just surprising. You know, you go to some of those places and they just have some great buildings. Of course, there are some that are the other way that are falling down and they don't seem to care. But no, I would tell somebody that I thought had some talent, you know, not everybody is able to do Grand Lodge. And you know, it depends on your, your life situation, your work situation. Because it does take up a lot of time a lot of energy, a lot of resources, but most of the stuff that we do are evenings and weekends. Now there are times that you got to take days off, but most of the time it's just your time and energy because it's you know, so many times you go right from work, you go to some kind of an event that happens so much. Uh, and that's what I would tell them, to be prepared for that. And I would make sure that his wife is on board with him because if, if she's not, he shouldn't do it. And that's why I wouldn't do it until Cindy finally relented. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, 
city was great. When I was in line at Blue Lodge, she came to all the events and she really helped. And, and we had a nice nucleus of, of young people. But um, I think Scottish Rite got her, well, where she wasn't so enthused at going to events. And it's my fault because I would be politicking and talking to people. And, and she didn't know a lot of people and she would be sitting there. And she says, I'm not doing that anymore. And she stopped going to stuff for a long time. Vicky calls it smoozing. Yeah. Um, how has masonry impacted your life? <sighs> yeah, I don't know what my life would be like if I hadn't gotten involved with the fraternity. Uh, I like to think that it was I was at a crossroads and uh, I took the right turn. Uh, I've just you can never give back all the things that you get from our, our fraternity and you know we're a voluntary organization so you're not getting financial rewards but the, the personal satisfaction and gratification that you get uh, there's just no way that you can match that or I don't know how any other way you could make that happen. Uh, I suppose if you got into politics or something like that, but you know, politics are so crooked that at least we have integrity. I don't, I'm not sure politicians have that. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm certainly not a wealthy man, but I, I have a wealth of friends and memories that I certainly wouldn't have without our fraternity. And that makes you a wealthy man. It does. Any well, final reflections on the fraternity? You know, we've seen a severe decline in our membership. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. It just maybe society, you know, from almost 200,000 members in the 50s to where we're at now, 35,000. And I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why, one, why we're, a lot of people still don't know that we exist. Uh, they see these movies and they say, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's an old fraternity or an old secret society or whatever they think it is. They don't realize it still exists. And that, that, I think there's a lot of people like that if they have heard of Masonry at all. But I think there's been so many movies out that it's come to the forefront. But when I joined back in the, in the 80s, I didn't, I had never heard of Masonry until Bill Smithers started talking about his lodge. And, you know, it's funny, uh, after I joined, come to find out that my mother's younger brother was a very active Mason in Illinois. Uh, and Scottish Rite, 32nd degree Mason. Uh, York Rite, he was a uh, nice temple. Uh, my oldest sister, her husband was a Mason, and she was Eastern Star. In fact, she was a worthy matron out at uh, Rochester, Stony Creek. And that was my sister, Virginia. My sister, Pat, who lives in Texas, uh, was a Eastern Star, and her husband's a Mason, and she was worthy matron of the, her chapter out there. Um, and and you, you find so many men that you didn't realize, uh, and all of a sudden now you find out that they're Masons. And it was just a whole world that I had not seen before. It was kind of eye-opening. Huh? I bet it was. Yeah. Well, Dean, thank you very much for being with us today and participating in the Legacy Series. We really appreciate it.